So I've always been fascinated by the idea of context, the idea that we understand the meaning of things by how they relate to the things around them. And I want to talk about AI from that perspective. And by AI, of course, I'm talking about what we're all abuzz about, generative AI, large language models, and agentic AI. So starting with a little context, we love tech, right? We all love tech. We love it so much that we don't mind that it's a little broken, right? We're years into web calls, but how many group calls start late, right? While we say, can you hear me? And check the microphone, right? We're still doing that, years in. For those of us who love the language learning app, like the really popular one, and we laugh about the fact that its chat function doesn't seem to really have any idea what we're saying, right? That when it does the text, uh, somebody there uses it, right? It says really funny things. And we love it so much that we have allowed the law to change to accommodate it. From the first time we shrink-wrapped a contract on the outside of a box of software in a sort of take-it-or-leave-it move, to changing the meaning of free in so many parts of the world, to an exchange of services for continued surveillance, to right now, when the issue around what the heck do we mean by ownership and copyright in the space of generative AI, that I am, if I want to be sure that somebody can see this talk later, I'm reduced to giving you a 90s-style PowerPoint because I don't know whether the images will be mine or not mine. And we really love tech, really love it, when it talks to us, right? So psychologists say that when things mimic or mirror human behavior, we have very deep reactions. And I think of that as why, for decades, the most popular toys are those that talk to us. If you're old enough, Chatty Cathy, Teddy Ruxpin, the Furby, Tickle Me Elmo, right? When they tell you, I love you, I want to be your friend, and they laugh with you, rational adults turn very irrational, all the way to literally fistfights among adults in toy stores when the supplies are low. So let's take this back to AI. I mean, those are animatronic, but let's, let's go back to the 1960s and the creation of a program called ELIZA. And it was a therapist. It was a clever program in which it had a series of questions that were common for a therapist to ask, because they ask questions, and the ability to pull a little piece of your answer um, and put it in the next question. So it kind of went like this. How was your day? I had a bad day. Tell me about your bad day. Had a fight with my boyfriend. Tell me about fight with my boyfriend. And so even though the grammar was wonky and you could pretty quickly see that the questions were repeating, people were mesmerized. They couldn't tear themselves away from this. And I can tell you when I saw it for the first time nearly 20 years later, it was still mesmerizing. And engineering students would sit at this, you know, monster typewriter looking things, doing this for as long as somebody wouldn't tear them away from the machine. The guy who wrote this software later wrote about how sort of concerned he was that very educated technologists would enormously exaggerate the capabilities of this software. The suspension of disbelief was incredible. So that brings us to today, when a month ago, a study said that our number one use of generative AI in the consumer space, therapy. So I think it's really important for people to understand what this software is doing. Because we talk about it, but not that many people talk about how does it work. We have for decades been trying to figure out how to get a computer to classify the meaning of things. And we started one word at a time, and then a phrase. Anybody remember n-grams? Basically, it made it possible for us to keyword search. And then we got to whole documents and the ability to to understand concepts. And I can tell you, I wrote a thesis in this space 20 years ago, so that gives you a time scale. Uh, around 10 years ago, we got to the point where some very clever people figured out how to actually classify meaning in an entire language. Um, and that gives us language to language translation and the ability to contextualize everything, all the words. It works kind of like this, if you remember your middle school graph with, right, that the x-axis and the y-axis, 
Basically, it gives every single word a statistical value that you can plot on a graph and then plot the relationship to every other word. So you see these, these are pretty obvious, but imagine, so how does that work at scale? You have to blow this up to the entire language. So man also relates to boy and father and uncle and brother. And man actually also relates to queen, right? To the rock band, the social context. So actually when we do this, it's a three dimensional graph for people who took extra math. It's got a Z axis. Um, and basically we do it for the entire language. So I like to, it's a little unfair, but I like to call it the grammar translator. Basically, this is why it's so good at paraphrasing, summarizing, helping us write when we are struggling to write something. What it's really doing is you tell it what you want, it's picking apart all your words, classifying them all, then converting that into a computer program that runs against data, which is either just a general set if you have what people call consumer grade, or if you're in a commercial space, you might be doing against a trusted set. So what could go wrong, right? <laughs> I have a friend who likes to refer to the current state of generative AI as the eager intern. I love that. Basically, smart, hardworking, well-intentioned, a little light on experience, and nuance, right? So what do we get? Wrong vector, right? It literally goes up the wrong path. Like, in April, when one of our most famous AIs kept insisting to me that Donald Trump is not the president of the United States. It was not a political opinion. It just was kind of stuck. And I thought about what would I do if this was a person? And I said, what day is today? And then said, since that's after the inauguration in the United States, why are you still saying this to me? And that was enough to, in my mind, get it to like hop the track over to the right vector and then get the statistic I was looking for. A little anthropomorphizing, but jumping to conclusions. If you've heard about hallucinations, this is um, because these technologies were built to predict rather than to search and answer. Predicting in theory is much more efficient, a lot faster. So when you think about when you text and it tries to guess your next word or the spelling of the rest of your word, now imagine it's doing it a whole concept. It's trying to figure out the entire thing you're trying to say and get there ahead of you. If you follow this in the news, there have been sad number of cases involving lawyers filing briefs in court with case names that are not real cases, citations that aren't real, and on. I'm going to argue it isn't that lawyers are worse or that AI for law is worse, but lawyers practice in the public eye. You don't see everybody else at work. But I will tell you, I, I have reason to believe the exact same kind of errors are going on everywhere. And then, what I like to think of as the three bears, right? Not enough data, too much data, just right. So in the not enough category, um, there's a, a meme going around right now in which the AI says, I've drawn you a clock that shows 2.30, and the picture of the clock shows 10.10. Because uh, the data that it's trained on is mostly advertisements where it's believed psychologically 10.10 is a really pleasing shape, looks like a check mark, a smile. And so it doesn't matter. You can give it all these instructions, try it out, somebody will fix it. But for a while, anyway, all you could get was 1010, no matter what you asked for. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of ways too much can happen. One of the ones that I think about a lot is during my years in, in um, corporations and government, um, we stuff data into systems that are not the data that the system was made for. Buying systems is expensive, putting new ones in is really time consuming, and so people just figure out how to use the one they got for other purposes. And if you happen to work there, either you know because people pass that on verbally or there are some cues in the system, but if you pluck the data out of there and put it into a training model, maybe that information comes along and maybe it doesn't. And so you can have a system that thinks all the data it got is about the subject the system was built for. I worked on one project in the government where after asking this question, we cataloged, I believe it was 21 other uses for this system. So what could go right, right? This is pretty cool stuff. I'm interested in context, so correlations is one example. I hated during the height of COVID how everything was 
the rate per 100,000, as if any of us think that way. I mean, maybe there's a statistician in here. But for the rest of us, so I looked up uh, the rate of COVID in BC last month, and then I thought, how do I understand that? I had to do the question asking, but I ultimately found out that the rate of COVID was approximately equivalent to the likelihood that you would win a $5 scratcher ticket, right? That you would win the $5 prize. Well, for a lot of people in the population, that's a much more known and understood experience, right? Not everybody, but for a lot of people, that's a very visceral understanding of about how this would come out. Context. You know, we can ask an AI already, tell me about the rate of fires uh, caused by wildfires, right? We're all interested, we're in wildfire season. What's the rate of wildfires caused by human behavior? But we could just as easily have a system that not only answers that, but tells us the rate of um, fires caused by natural things like, like lightning, so that we could get the context when we got the information. And my um, sort of dream state, ecosystem analytics. At one point, I worked on something called policy reasoning, and we were trying to actually compute law you know, do the same kind of parsing and get it to actually give the answers to legal questions. And people would always ask me, wow, can your AI look at all the law in the jurisdiction and tell us where the conflicts are between laws? Because there are so many and they have so many subparts. We know that sometimes there's two laws on the books that actually say it's kind of the opposite thing. So the answer has always been no. But with this technology, if it's accurate, we could do stuff like that, right? So the amazing things we could do. But it's really important to remember, this is a business. Hundreds of billions of dollars are changing hands right now in the enthusiasm and the run up of these technologies. So again, I wanna go backwards before I talk about the present. Five nines. Five nines is a concept that came up quite a while ago in technology when mainframe computers were relatively new in the commercial workspace, um, so say kind of early 80s maybe, it was a huge deal to get to 90% uptime. Systems crashed all the time. 90% sounds like a really big number and it was really exciting to get there, but if you think about it, that means the system's down two and a half hours a day, right? That's a lot of outage. Fast forward. Now, pretty much every contract that offers anything about machine performance promises you five nines, 99.9999% right? That's what five nines is about. And basically, if you do the math, that means they're promising your system will be down less than one second a day. That's a pretty big move in that last 10% from 90% to almost 100%. So that's what we want to think about in the context of where we are with generative AI. There are a lot of different measures that people are throwing out there. There's accuracy measures, transparency, accountability, ethics, speed, customer satisfaction. There's a lot of things out there. One fairly important person in the space has argued that it should just be 80% because human performance is 80%. First of all, I'm like, which human for which job, right? I, I kind of want my bank statement to be better than that. And I was reminded in my own life of having voted no at a major financial institution when voice recognition had gotten to 80%, which was amazing. And the vendor was so excited and my colleagues were so excited. And I said, wait a minute, that means that when people call this institution, one out of five customers will be misidentified. I vote no, <laughs> right? So the context is so important. Even 99%, which sounds incredible. If that's the brakes on your car, that means like three days a year, <laughs> you know, you're kind of on your own, right? <laughs> so you really want to think about which metric for what purpose. So Stephen Hawking said that the enemy of intelligence is not ignorance. It's the illusion of intelligence. So with that in mind, I ask all of you, what is the five nines metric you want for AI? 
And who do you want to tell? <laughs>